Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. Uh, this will conclude the three-part series that I've been preaching on, um, Community and Faith, and we'll see kind of what God does with those Israelites. Numbers chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation, and said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of Israelites. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among these who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the Israelites, The land that we went through as spies is exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are no more than bread to us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the whole congregation threatened to stone them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting for all the Israelites, and the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have among them, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. But the Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for in your might you brought, us, brought this people from the land among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land, They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of the people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud hands over them, and you go in front of them in a pillar of a cloud by day and by night, and by a pillar of fire. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. Pray with me, please. Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I grant, ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching. Let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to the beloved gathered in this house today, I ask that you grant them the gift of hearing. May these words speak to us, guide us, and enrich us as we seek to fulfill your calling with each passing day. In your son's name, amen. At this point in the Israelites' life, they had been whining consistently since they left Egypt. So since the Israelites have been liberated from Egypt, they have done nothing but whine. Wine, 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 wine. They are in a new journey. They are in something that they are not familiar with. They knew how to be slaves in Egypt. They knew how to do what they were told. They knew how to go to the homes that were provided for them. They knew how to do the tasks that were put before them. But they didn't know how to do. So they knew how to do what they were told blindlessly, because for countless generations, that's exactly what was expected of them. They had been slaves for a couple of three centuries. So the idea of thinking independently, the idea of learning how to get along with someone who thought differently with you, is a new concept because they were blindless followers for countless generations. Now they've been liberated. They've been given all this power, all this ability, and they are afraid of it. Because every time they stepped out of step, what would happen? They would be punished. They would be struck down. They would have the living snot beat out of them. But that's what they knew. 
That's what they had grown accustomed to. When the Vietnam War came to an end and there were a number of POWs that came years later, one of the hardest things that they had was acclimating back into the American lifestyle. Now, granted, the culture was an upheaval because the Vietnam War was, I think we fought more here in the U.S. than we did over there in country, quite honestly. But when the soldiers came back, the ones that had been captive, they didn't know how to function in a natural, normal society. It was encouraged that the homes of soldiers who were captured and hadn't come back for years, that they not be forced to come into large crowds. Stay away from loud noises. Make sure that they lived in a particular routine because their life had been so routinized. There were some stories and some vets that I knew that they would encourage family members and friends to inflict pain upon them, to torture them in a particular manner because that is what they knew. That is what they'd been accustomed to. Now, I don't know if the Israelites were asking to be whipped or whatever, but they certainly didn't know how to handle the freedom they had. You see, while they worked and slaved to grow the Egyptian empire, their food was provided for them. Their homes were provided for them. Their clothing was provided for them. They didn't have to generate any of it for themselves. Now they did. Instead of having survival handed to them on a plate, they had to rely on someone else to provide it with less consistency, maybe. Definitely less volume than they were used to. That's the source of their whining. That's why they say, it was better in Egypt. We knew, how, we knew what to expect every day. Work, live. Not work, have pain. Work, go home, have a meal, not work. Hmm. We may not see our next meal. They are at a place where they are totally dependent on the providence of God, that which God will give them. Every morning they gave them something to eat that they didn't know what it was. Once a week he started giving them meat by sending birds. For a period of time, this is their habit. This is their pattern. This is how they live. And it becomes second nature. They do things almost unconsciously, but don't know if they necessarily enjoy it. They've marched around. They've gone from the mountain of Sinai. They've walked around the Negev a little bit, and now here they are on the border of the Promised Land. We call it Israel. They call it the Promised Land. A land of milk and honey. Now, to, to us... We just go to the grocery store for that. If we want honey, we have Nelson Haynes give it to us out of his beehives. It's good stuff if you haven't had it yet. But we have easy access to it. We thoroughly oversee the rich, luxurious gift that these are. In a land that can support milk and honey, that basically means that milk came from goats, not cattle. And your wealth, your lusciousness, how well God was blessing you in this world depended you on how large your herd was. If you had 50 sheep, 50 goats, you were doing pretty good. If you had 250, wow, you really had God's ear. This is a land that would sustain that sort of life. Didn't have to go searching hard for the water. There, were, there was grass and grains there for them to eat. They would immediately grow fat. Everyone would have a blessing of God. They would have an abundance of goats, milk and meat. Honey, not from bees, from dates and figs. As you let them sit on the tree, the, the sugar starts to ooze out, and they would squeeze it, and they would turn it into a spread that they would put on their breads or put on their grains that they would eat, or sometimes just lick it off their fingers. You know, you hear the stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament about how a, fig, a person would tend to a fig grove. Their job was to go and to squeeze the figs to start having the juices come out so they would have the honey flow, flow freely from the fruit. You also have it run down your elbow. These, again, were signs of luxury, riches, riches that they had never known in Egypt. 
just waiting for them right across the border in the promised land. They had sent spies. The spies came back. Majority of them are scared because they said these were the descendants of Anak. Anak was some ancient person who settled in the land of Canaan. His descendants were known to be giants, huge, tall people. The descendants of Anak, to give you an understanding, were the ancestors to the Philistines, to Goliath, who stood nine and a half feet tall. These people were giants, and the Israelites would look like ants, and they were afraid that they crossed the border, they would be smooshed out. Obstacle after obstacle, lifestyle change, relationship to God change, move around, not be steady change, go into a new land, not know what to do change. And they're like, are you nuts? At least we knew what to expect back in Egypt. Let's go. Let's go back to the old way. It wasn't perfect, but at least we could handle that. This unknown, these fears, I don't know if I can handle that. And two people stood up to the crowd. Joshua and Caleb. And they went, are you all hearing yourselves? This is the God that rescued us. This is the God that gave us stuff to eat when we were hungry, gave us protein with the animals on the weekends. This is the one that took us to the Red Sea. This is the one that took us out of Egypt, made Pharaoh stop holding us in place. This is the one who's provided every need that we've had, not our wants, our needs. And now you're saying this is too big for God? How many centuries had they been waiting to go back to the promised land? At least six. And they're saying, you don't think God can handle this? They're addressing the fear of the future. They're confronting it. And we know how the story unfolds. God basically had every person of doubt was not allowed to enter the promised land. Only the people of faith could. And the only two members out of the whole population that was liberated was Joshua and Caleb. Not even Moses saw the promised land. He saw it, but he didn't enter it. The people who had barriers in their faith were not allowed to not merely observe the riches that God had in store, but to embrace, to partake, to live through, to enjoy. Because what they chose in their faith journey was what they knew. And what they knew was to not how to trust God, but to trust themselves. We face calling and changes by God all the time. It can be as simple as being graceful to let someone go in front of you in line at the grocery store because they have two items and you have 42 items. It could be someone who's having difficulty getting out of their vehicle because of the snow holding the door for them or helping them with their walker. It can be holding to the commitment that you're going to be supportive of something, even though traversing the elements is a real pain in the neck. You're being patient to see what God's going to say for the future of a church that you've known for many years. We all have barriers. Good ones that protect us, which I think is God's presence, and bad ones that we use to keep God's presence out. The Israelites chose the bad ones. Let us go back to Egypt. Let's go back to what we know. Let's just stay in our routine that we've had for eons in a day and follow that because that's what's easy for us. But God does not call us to do what is easy. God calls us to be faithful. That whatever step we take, we trust that God is putting the right stone underneath that foot to support us. 
When building a building, it's a question of the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the most important thing that you set because it's where all the building rests. It's where all the weight is buoyed as the rest of the building is erected, at least in old-time building talk. Today, we use a center beam and a foundation. But in a church, it's a question of what is it that we rally around? What is it that we come together at? Is it the shepherd? Is it the creator? Is it the rules? Is it an idea? What do we rally around? Scripture is very clear. People of God are to come together in the Spirit through the blood of Jesus Christ. What that means here, how that plays out here, what the future of that is here, the details, is uncertain. But God has a plan. And he's preparing us for that plan. What are the barriers that we erect? Barriers that we're conscious of and not even aware of. For myself, the barrier is trying to figure out, gee, what do I do that doesn't screw up the future? I have a lot of anxiety about that as a transition pastor. I have that in every congregation that I work with. Yes, you are congregation number seven. But I've had the same fear in every congregation I've been at, and that fear is my barrier. And at some point in time, I will just let go of it and go, all right, God, it's yours. We'll do what you need to do. Today, right now, feeling fragmented, yeah, I'm not there, and I'm very honest to say that, but I know that it will come for me. I don't know how it will come about for you all. I'll ask questions. I'll give ideas. But at some point, we will focus and rally and come together. And when that rally happens, what will we do? Will we embrace the barriers of what we've known and done for eons in a day? Or we will sit there and be spiritual healers, heroes like Caleb and Joshua who will say, come on, God's got a plan. Let's get rid of our problems. Let's move forward. Because whatever it is that God has in store for us, God will make happen. And why? We'll go back to creation. Everything that God made was good. They were afraid to step into the spiritual unknown. Sometimes I feel that way. In my own journey, with my wife's health issues, continuing to settle my father's estate after his passing, looking after my sister's care as she's acclimating continually into her new group home, my son as he comes home with his drama of being in middle school, which I really try hard not to laugh at. Oh, y'all been there, okay. We have, you taught it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's just easy to go into autopilot and just either ignore it or obsess about it. But it takes work. It takes intentionality to say, not God, here's my problem. Here's my barrier. Here's my obstacle. But to look at your problem, your barrier, and obstacle and say, Oi, that is my God. I dare you to overcome that. Instead of a position of resignation, we take a position of proclamation. One of the banes that I look at in getting this church to move forward is this kitchen project. It's a good idea. It's not a well-defined idea. But it is a dream. And it has potential. 
And I do think that God has a plan for it. I'm not sure we've been able to identify exactly what that is, but what we're doing right now is we're sharing the dream about it. So that the, what is it now? How much do we owe on it? Do we still need to? The $45,000. $45,000 out of a congregation of an average attendance of 62 on a Sunday morning is a huge undertaking. But not impossible. It is huge. But not impossible. We get that taken care of. And then the stuff of getting the house in spiritual order, I think will fall like dominoes right into place, making a beautiful mosaic pattern. But I see that as the barrier right now, today. I don't know what your issues are with it. I don't know how far you're behind it. I don't know how much you question it. But I do know that until that is resolved, what we try to do in here, what we try to do in the community, will mean nothing. And I do mean nothing. Getting that done, getting that out of the way, it's a barrier. And then it unlocks the spiritual potential. So right now, my efforts are focused on getting that done. Because I want it off my plate. I didn't want to inherit it, but I did. Pastors inherit things they don't necessarily want. Projects and individuals. No offense. Well, you were quick to laugh on that one. (laughs) But those are barriers to overcome. Physical, financial, spiritual. How many of you have given this kitchen to God and said, God, use me? How many of you have given this kitchen to God and saying, God, help me figure out a way to use it? Instead of, Forty-five grand holy nuts. It's an opportunity to show our faithfulness. And that is the choice that all community of faith have. You either step forward in faithfulness, or you step away in fear. You step forward in giving yourselves to God, or you step away giving yourself to yourself. You step forward in trust or you step away in denial. My other favorite is to stand there and just do nothing and go, yep, there it is. It is what it is. I want to take a five iron to those folks. If you start seeing a five iron show up in my church, you'll know that stress is coming up. (laughs) Seriously. Small houses do powerful things. Moses was moving 600,000 individuals. Two stood up for God, and they saw the providence of the promised land. Jesus picked 12 apostles. 11 of them started the New Testament church. One adopted later on, took the church to the Gentiles, which you and I are now part of that movement, the work of Paul. Small groups, small bodies did amazing things, but they moved forward as a community of faith. Not of routinized programming. They were innovative. They changed their attack and approach as the needs of their body and community changed. They grew in their awareness of their surroundings and gave it to God for God to lead them. I think you all can do the same. I think you all can do the same. But we got a barrier. And we need to address it. We need to get it done. We need to let God continue to watch over us and guide us, but help us be creative in getting that barrier out of the way. Because I think when that one's removed, then we can see the other areas and give the attention and focus onto those. Which, there will always be something that needs attention and focus. That's just part of being people and as part of being the church, the broken community of God's kingdom that shows how God's power overcomes brokenness, not how we can be the perfect example to the world. 
Not even close. They overcame the barriers. That's, as a community of faith, what we are called to do. Show our barriers to God and let God deal with them through us, with us, among us. That's what this table does. These elements help us, remind us of a covenant that we made with God to say, yes, God, I will trust you. Yes, I will embrace your son. Yes, I will take my brokenness, like the brokenness of Jesus' body, my brokenness, and I will give it to you. Through the bread and the cup, you will make it whole. You will take that which I am afraid of, that which I am embarrassed of, that what I would like to hide from the world. You will expose it, and you will make something that I consider ugly, something beautiful. Because a barrier that I would run away from, you have handled. You see, that's what sin is. In making that choice, it's a barrier between ourselves and God. And our coming to this table renews our commitment that you, God, can overcome all of my, all of our all of the world's barriers with grace, with peace, and with love. That's what moving moving forward as a community of faith is all about. Embracing the brokenness. Identifying the barriers giving them to God and letting God take something that we consider ugly and distasteful and confusing and embarrassing and turns it into a beacon of light and a gospel witness. That's what this house should be. Roof leaks and all. Burst pipes and all. Unfinished kitchen and all. Those are the elements and the physical structures The church is the people's relationship with God and each other as it reaches out to the world. What are our barriers? I know one. We have several. So as we move from our time of teaching into our time of communion, and as we sing our communion song, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Think for a moment or two. Think about the things you've got blocking God from you, that you got yourself blocking from God. Think about the barriers that you have. Quietly, silently, internally, confess them to God. Wipe your heart clean, let his love come in, and renew your commitment to allow God to overcome those barriers, whatever they may be. Big or small, I don't think it makes a difference. A barrier is a barrier. But we are on a Sunday where we are going to have the bread and the cup. We are on a Sunday when we are talking about being a community of faith. We are on a journey together from where we are to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And today is a day to put them for God and give those barriers to God. So let's try that. Let's start that. Let's begin our journey together. Before we go into our song, I'm going to do a quick little prayer. And then we're going to take that first significant step together. Okay? Let us pray. Loving God, we are your children and we are made in your image and we are saved by the blood of your son, Jesus the Christ, on that cross. But we are nowhere near where we need to be. No matter how hard we try, we can't get there because we put things up that get in the way of your love. 
Help us prepare our hearts and our minds to confess those to you. To be honest with you, honest with ourselves, so together, God, you and ourselves, individually and as a body, can start working to overcome those barriers and let your love flow. Let your light shine. Let the healing power and presence of your spirit remove our barriers so we can reach the potential of our kingdom power. We ask this in your son's precious and holy name this morning. Amen.